morning, everyone. We're going to start today's panel presentation. Thanks for every, everybody for showing up uh, for the first session of the morning. I'm sure there were lots of late nights last night getting caught up with colleagues. Uh, I'm really happy to be here today to talk about uh, Simply E and eBooks and really opening up and maximizing access to our digital eBook collections um, through the use of a new open source platform and a new exchange that DPLA launched. With me today, I have three uh, colleagues who will be on the panel talking about their experience uh, with Simply E in a variety of ways. I have James English from New York Public Library, who is actually the founder owner of Simply at New York Public, and he'll be talking about the Simply open source platform and what its capabilities are. I have Dave Millman from NYU who will be talking about Simply E in their academic library, their use case, and the challenges and opportunities they see moving forward. And then last, we were talking with Rob Cardellano, who is investigating Simply E in his library as a new technology to really maximize access to eBooks in his academic library, as well as completely improve the patron experience using Simply E. So the, the point of this presentation is to really give um, everybody in the room an idea of how we are deploying uh, open eBooks, eBooks, and Simply E in the public library system through a pilot, and then look at how that experience may translate to the needs of academic libraries. I feel that there are many similar challenges and similar opportunities, but they are nuanced in terms of how ebooks are used in academic libraries versus public libraries, and what new requirements might come uh, as a result in order for such a platform and a technology and a solution to work for academic libraries. We hope to leave uh, time for questions. Uh, that's always challenging with four panel speakers, but uh, that's the goal, and you'll have all our emails and extra links that you can talk to us uh, after the presentation or, or beyond. So with that, uh, many of you are probably familiar with DPLA. Uh, DPLA, Digital Public Library of America, was really started to provide open access to all the digital cultural materials held by libraries, museums, and archives around the country. We partner with 2,500 institutions to be able to provide open access to their materials at the dp.la site. But beyond that, we've been really tasked to really provide maximum access to ebooks. And this was something that was near and dear to the Sloan Foundation. So they've provided us with significant grant funding to really figure out how to change the marketplace and the dynamics of how ebooks is delivered today to public libraries. And why uh, they were so interested in this is that public libraries have. Um, a few vendors which control all the trade ebooks, and they are delivering those ebooks in proprietary and siloed systems. So libraries aren't able to take their licensed and purchased content and mix that content with open ebook streams that they might uh, get from public domain books, they might get from um, you know, other authors that want to provide public access to their books. So for their users, in order to access these different types of content, licensed content, trade books, open content, they need to go to a variety of siloed systems, which all also have their own proprietary apps. If you guys have ever been to a public library, um, you probably know that you'll go to your library catalog and you'll say, hey, I want this digital book, and that will shoot you off to a completely different system. Many times it's OverDrive, which has its own platform and its own app for you to access that book. Then if you want an audio book, it will shoot you off to another system to do that. So it really is a disparate and not pleasant experience for the end user. So we are trying uh, to change that by um, changing the way, changing the delivery and the access uh, to those books through an open system. So in order to do this, a couple years ago, you really have to work with the current uh, vendors and publishers to start to think about how do we create common standards such that um, we can get these 
trade books into open systems as opposed to having all these separate siloed systems. So one of the groups that really helped push that forward was Readers First. And this is a group of nearly 300 libraries that came together in part um, with NYPL support and with DPLA as a partner to really put together a set of principles to improve access to ebooks through standard APIs. And once, um, because what was happening at the time is the vendors were negotiating individual deals with libraries in terms of who would get access to the API and, and who wouldn't. And so this kind of leveled the playing field such that all libraries would be able to get access to open APIs that these vendors were using, therefore able to integrate those data streams into different systems, which might be open systems and not the proprietary solutions that were only offered by the vendor. So through the um, publishing of the open APIs, that really opened up the opportunity to really start to change the landscape. So from there, DPLA this summer, with the support of Sloan Foundation, has put together a pilot, which is uh, going forward with six libraries, which I'll, I'll show you later, and put together what's called DPLA Exchange. So this is uh, really a marketplace where libraries can purchase um, trade content, but also there are open content streams. So there are public domain books in the exchange. We are curating open content. Uh, we are working with several partners that have open textbooks, that have um, other open kids books. Uh, we also have the ability to buy books and put those books in open content for distribution. So really uh, trying to maximize uh, the library's access to not only the trade content, but also the, the open content in one single platform. And the open content, librarians can just download that content and then put it into their circulation manager um, alongside the, um, the, the license content. So that's, that's very attractive. So what does that look um, in a system you have on the back end, content coming from the DPL exchange. You could have content coming through other vendors via the API, which I've talked about. You can have other open content streams through what's called an OPDS feed. Uh, and all of that content then becomes exposed in the circulation manager. So for our purposes, for our pilot, we're using Library Simplified. We've chosen this because we believe in open source. This is an open source platform which was, is being developed by the community and funded by the community of players, IMLS, Mellon. Uh, and so what this, this allows, it really allows libraries to take back control of the delivery of their eBooks. They can mix and match content from a variety of vendors. They can add open content using the library simplified platform. They can then figure out how they want that content curated meaning what does the patron see, what is the delivery of that content, and then at the end, it gets delivered through a mobile app called Simply. So all that content stream comes together in the circulation manager and then is delivered through one end user app called Simply, which is also part of this open source solution. So that, I feel, is really a game changer for libraries in terms of taking ownership of the eBooks and maximizing access to their patrons through a single solution. So we're currently deploying and piloting this system, um, this set of solutions. Uh, our pilot libraries are those listed on the slide here, but we have a mix of state libraries, consortiums, uh, small public libraries, with some academic libraries actually in this mix through the consortial uh, group. And so they are testing the DPLA exchange we are, as part of DPLA, we have a curation core, um, which is a group of librarians that we are working with to curate additional open content to put into the exchange. Uh, also talking with academic um, folks that have academic holdings, such as Hathi Trust, Internet Archive, MIT Press, to potentially curate some of their content and put it in the open stream for access if they would like that exposure. Um, and with that process, we're also creating what's called an OPDS feed. So anybody can connect to that feed 
and then download that content, not download, access that content in their circulation manager. So you don't even have to use the exchange. The OPDS feed will be available for any library to tap into. Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to James, who will talk about the Simply E platform. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is James English. Uh, I'm not a librarian, uh, but I uh, have a great passion and love for the library. I've been at NYPL for about four years. I started in 2013, coming from Atlanta, Georgia, where I ran a small software company. Uh, but I really wanted to move to New York City, and uh, there was something about this project that really spoke to me. So NYPL at that time had won a, a grant from the IMLS, a leadership uh, award, digital leadership award, to ex improve the user experience getting e-books. Um, so when I arrived there, we had a couple of months to kind of think about it, look at the grant. We were awarded that in late 2013 after they reopened the government. And uh, we got to work uh, shortly thereafter in 2014 with our first engineering hire in May of uh, 2014. Um, when we took this on, we said instead of just piloting and exploring uh, solutions, let's just fix the problem. Uh, we as libraries, we have access to the same engineering talent and pools of uh, engineers out there that the commercial industry does. So any type of uh, doubt that a library would have about its ability to affect its future with technology is really unfounded. We draw from the same engineering pool, and we did. We actually got some of the best engineers out there, Leonard Richardson, uh, Gwendolyn Quinn, who did the first uh, iterations of the app, both of them leaders in the technology industry and in the open source community. Um, so, what is Simply E? Well, to fix this problem, we had to do two things. We had to build a mobile app, a reading solution, and we also had to build a number of other things to kind of take care of the mess in the background that was the ebook distribution and supply chain. So it's middleware, mobile apps, there are web apps, so we have uh, uh, actually some web tools like a web reader as well as a web catalog that will aggregate and unify the collections. We also have an open source community because we believe through collective action that libraries, again, can pool their resources to affect the industry to make the industry shape to its will as well as solve its own problems if the industry can't bring to, to bear uh, the technologies they demand and deserve. Um, many in the academic community already do that. Uh, research libraries have a rich history in open source software and they pretty much redefine their own destiny and kind of pilot uh, uh, new explorations and technology to uh, further their academic research. So taking a cue from that, we really settled on making this an open source app and then investing our time to make this an open source community. It's also a collection of libraries. Uh, we couldn't have done it as NYPL without our partner libraries and without our partners like DPLA and other foundations out there, uh, this would really not be where it is today. And then it's also a labor of love. There's uh, the engineers, myself, uh, we really love this concept. We love libraries. So uh, we really dig at it on a daily basis. Um, why Simply E? As Michelle uh, talked about, you know, content vendor equals app. That meant basically libraries were relegated to being a sales acquisition force for different content uh, providers out there. Uh, we were giving them our users. We were making our users sign up to their terms of service. Um, this meant that those users, our patrons, had to deal with walled collections, uh, multiple apps, non-interoperable technology. So if they accidentally borrowed a book in one platform and they didn't know it was, that was uh, a different platform than what they liked to use, they were kind of out of luck, but the libraries had to kind of deal with the emotional trauma of trying to get them to a new app or just tell them that that content is not available for them on their reading app. There is a lack of accessibility. Uh, we recognized early in 2013 in our industry scan that libraries are uniquely uh, positioned as the only people that serve this community of need. Uh, at the time, Library of Congress, through its uh, National Library Services and its BARD app, were the only uh, tools available. Bookshare came on with Benetech. Uh, Learning Ally was mostly serving uh, uh, the K through 12 industry. But in terms of libraries, we basically pointed them at our, our, our Library for the Blind and Braille uh, books and the BARD app, uh, tapes, different digital devices. But on the commercial side where we spent millions of dollars on our collection, that content was not available to them. And so we saw that really as not only a travesty, but an opportunity for, this, uh, for our efforts uh, on a principal basis. 
And then speaking of principles, lack of privacy. Again, when you lease apps to a uh, consumer you're, uh, from a commercial company, you're basically having your users sign on to those terms and conditions. Uh, regardless of what's in your contract, uh, we know how technology is built is how you actually implement uh, those contractual terms of uh, data security and privacy. And this was something we had to really uh, slog through with some of our vendors because, quite frankly, a lot of it wasn't secure. A lot of the data uh, was open and exposed. Um, we even taught one really, really big uh, ebook provider what uh, transport layer security was because they frankly didn't know. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was a good learning point for some of them. Um, we also go to great lengths to anonymize uh, the data so that if there are things that, uh, like tokens, uh, we go to uh, links to even anonymize those so that our vendors can't connect a, readers, a user's reading history through any type of transaction, whether it be DRM or just the simple download of a book or a file or browse of a catalog uh, to understand their reading history. And we go to great lengths to do that in the app. So what does it do? Well, it basically turns this. This was the ebook reading experience for New York Public Library. You came in through one catalog app, and after a number, a number, a number of steps, you eventually got to download another app. And then in that app, you had to go back through the discovery experience again, uh, as well as some log on, transaction, DRM, sign up issues, to eventually get to a book. Totaled about 17 steps. So we set a goal for ourselves, three clicks or less to a book. So it literally is find a book, hit borrow or get, and then start reading the book. It's a fully DRM compatible uh, book. We use Adobe DRM. We use it in a unique way. We separated their rendering engine because, again, accessibility was a key feature of us, a uh, principle of ours as well as interoperability. Uh, and we felt that standards such as EPUB 2 and EPUB 3 were, the t uh, were what we should be investing in as libraries, as our content media type. Um, <clears throat> so we can use that DRM, um, but we separate the rendering technology from that DRM. Uh, we also use, a, again, through open source licensing, uh, we make this technology and our innovations in it available to the community, both commercial and for nonprofit. So as if university libraries or public libraries or large consortia or state library systems want to take the technology, brand it, use it as their own, they're free to do so. Or they can join the community and help us extend it, build onto it, improve it. Um, and the commercial industry can do the same, and some are. Uh, we've actually had code contributions from commercial vendors who now see, I want my content in there. Instead of making us do the hard work through the APIs, they actually go into the open source project, write those modules, make them available, so that as libraries go to install Simply E, they can just choose a vendor, add the credentials for it, and now that content vendor's uh, uh, materials go straight into the catalog along with all the other material. Um, we couldn't, have, again, we couldn't do this alone. We had a community to help us uh, for the open source software side. We partnered with uh, the Redium Foundation, who at the time was forming a foundation and really uh, aimed at the commercial industry, and we wanted to see the libraries take a part in this. Again, coming from the commercial side, you know, one way to affect standards is get into the standards bodies and shape the industry from a standards set if you can't compel uh, the market through market forces. Uh, so we started partnering, we put our weight behind the Redium Foundation to make the rendering engine. Uh, we also have partnered with the European Digital Reading Lab, who is making another, uh, who is also developing on that rendering engine, and, and, uh, as well as different DRM technologies, making those available as open source to the broader industry. Uh, we also use a, uh, found a standard out there called OPDS, it was actually noted in the uh, Chief of Office of State Library, uh, Librarians to look at this in 2010. Open Library from the Internet Archive was actually using it uh, uh, for their uh, Open Library project. And so we put our weight behind that uh, standard because it was open and it was accessible and it really made sense when you thought, uh, thought about it in the larger context of the web and how technology shaped the web. Um, so it's basically an atom feed for your collection. We do the aggregation on the back end with the middleware, but we syndicate that feed out through a normalized, standardized interface and protocol that any other client application can consume and use and display. So if you're a library and you want a unique uh, client experience, you can just consume that OPDS feed. Uh, if you're another commercial app and you make a better app than Simply E, doubt it, but uh, <laughs> if you do that, uh, then uh, you can uh, use our same OPDS feed. Uh, so we have, there's a company, uh, Adeco, that's a, a feedbooks app. They're the largest, they're like the overdrive of Europe. 
uh, their app can consume our content just as it, by pointing their app at our feeds, and it works just as uh, fine as it does in their app. Uh, and then you have the DAISY Consortium, which is a consortium of uh, uh, technology platform providers for the visually and reading impaired, uh, as well as the W3C, which has just recently consumed the International Digital Publishing Forum, who is the maintainer of the uh, EPUB 2 and EPUB 3 specification. So what's next? Well, not all of those standards take effect early on, so a lot of that work that we did, we just had to brute force it through with API integrations. We had to help vendors troubleshoot their APIs, redefine some of those APIs, uh, debug some of those APIs. But when we went about it, we were able to actually get a lot of this work done and get a lot of integrations under the hat. We have, you know, the, as you can see, uh, six of these different type of ILS providers. Uh, we can do, uh, take on about eight different models of ILS for integration uh, to make the authentication, basically, of the app work through your uh, already embedded library systems. And then from the content supply, we continually add new, uh, new ones every day. This list isn't reflective of all of them. Uh, we have a, a new vendor coming on that just submitted their code. We didn't do the work, they did, uh, to make this, uh, ap the application integrate into those content sources as well. And what does that allow us to do? As you can see there on the, I guess your left, there's a bunch of libraries in there. And I think you'll get a, a peek at that uh, later on, I predict, in the, in the presentation about um, what this will allow libraries to do in the application being relevant. Uh, what's coming next? Audiobooks and PDF support. Especially for the academic and research community, we know about 90% of your contents in PDF locked away in that fixed layout format, uh, non-accessible format. But uh, look, we got to do it. So we are going to do it. Uh, audiobooks, fast-growing uh, type of media uh, that's become very popular. It's also a good media type for those that have reading uh, difficulties. Uh, they can still participate in our cultural zeitgeist and, and be a member of what the reading community does, even if they're just listening to the book or reading along and listening to the book. We're a growing community. We have a lot of interest out there in every state. We have active deployments in uh, many states across the U.S. Many are in the processes of putting together their RFPs, securing their funding and their budgets uh, so that they can add this uh, to their uh, library ebook services. We have about 14, 17 systems that are in some uh, process of implementing Simply E or in the process of uh, going through their uh, development of it or their implementation of it, uh, which constitutes at today right now in the app about 350 local public libraries being able to get content through Simply E. And we hope to grow that mostly through partnerships like DPLA um, and the uh, different state libraries and consortials uh, that service and aggregate ebook services for libraries. So, now I'm going to pass the mic over uh, to my colleague, David, and uh, talk about uh, where we could uh, potentially, uh, potentially participate with the academic library space. Thanks. Hi. Um, <clears throat> we came at this uh, in two different ways. Uh, we, we had been working on a project uh, with our university press and a couple of other Minnesota press and, and Michigan press on a project called Enhanced Networked Monographs. Uh, we spoke about that this time here last year, uh, so many of you heard about that, and so I won't go into much detail there. Um, it's basically uh, trying to enhance the experience of research users, faculty, scholars, those kinds of people. And so uh, we used an open source platform called Redium, which renders EPUBs in the browser. Uh, we're using Hypothesis as a tool for annotation, and um, many of you are familiar with that technology. Uh, we're working with a small company called Infoloom that is making a sort of meta back of the book index, so you can do semantic navigation across different, uh, you know, a corpus of books. Um, and we did some uh, user experience research to try to understand better uh, what scholars want and you know, how that's different than what casual readers want. Uh, and there's a URL for our project page that you can check out. And I'm sure these slides will be available later. Um, um, the, the coincidence there was that Simply E is also using the Redium technology. So we started talking with James a couple years ago about, you know, 
is there you know an overlap? Is there some way we can leverage each other's technical skills? What's you know what could we do with each other? And at that time, New York Public was rolling out uh, the platform for their public library audience, and was really super successful at that. It went, it went really well, um, and. Uh, uh, but it but it was different audience than what we had been thinking about. But New York Public Library is, of course, also an important research library. And so as they started turning their attention to what their research scholars needed, uh, we started spending more time together. Uh, and um, and here we are. So we're you know, <clears throat> spending a lot of time together. The um, the other the other parallel track that we're on is that as a library we have, uh, of course, our own ebook holdings. So our our Enhanced Network Monographs Project is a kind of an R&D project. It's funded by the Mellon Foundation, and we're looking at a collection of about 100 EPUBs to try out these scholarly tools on it. Uh, meanwhile, NYU Libraries subscribes to about a million and a half eBooks. Uh, most of those we get through eBook Central, um, and um, uh, with the attendant issues that 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 uh, have been mentioned. Uh, so I would just want to go into that context for for a minute because uh, many of you are familiar. If you're supporting your library ebook, you know distribution, uh, these are pretty difficult problems. And so we're working with with our uh, collections and technical services staff to try to to address these. But it, they're kind of large issues. So there's a bunch of dependencies that kind of multiply on top of each other. And so. Um, you know, they create a really bad experience, and it's so bad that our, uh, you know, we're doing all this UX research, and we're talking to our customers, and we're talking to our students, and, I, and most of our students are not aware that we have any eBooks at all. We have a million and a half of them that we pay for, and they don't even know. They're getting them from Kindles. And, um, uh, one, so one of the reasons is the cataloging's inconsistent. Uh, our discovery services sometimes uh, do inconsistent things about whether they're uh, displaying a, a, an E version when there's a P version available or vice versa, and sometimes that works. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, these are big production systems, uh, and they're difficult ships to turn. Um, we have strange variants in the way access controls are enforced, so a lot of these are behind you know, different kinds of paywalls and subscription services, and our faculty tend to want to cut and paste from you know, looking at the book experience and paste that into their learning management system course you know, reference, and that almost never works because those URLs have all kinds of proxy stuff embedded in them or session management things, and. Um, it's really difficult to, to create a seamless service so that faculty get what they want out of that. Uh, we, the, the license terms vary. Um, uh, often um, faculty wanna, want to put these books on reserve um, and we don't know whether there are enough copies on reserve. The transactions are really slow to find those things out. Uh, it's really common for faculty to want to put single chapters on reserve the way they always used to in print, and those kinds of license agreements are really rare. Um, and again, I mentioned cutting and pasting from the, the learning management systems. It's, it's a really, really common use case that's just not supported well at all. Um, and of course, faculty you know, often have uh, the notion of specific editions in mind, and that's just hard, very hard to address. So our public service and instructional librarians uh, go out talking to faculty uh, uh, less and less frequently because they just kind of get beat up as soon as they do. Um, <clears throat> it's, you know, they come back with their head down. It's terrible. And, and uh, um, uh, so we're pretty excited about this. And Rob is going to talk about, like, we think, you know, we've got, you know, we're t turning a corner. We might have some critical mass. This is kind of exciting and maybe a call to action. Uh, we're interested in figuring out how to, how to continue our parallel track so that we're adding these uh, technical features for scholars. So things like, um, you know, is an OPDS feed compatible with the way scholars are searched for known items, or, you know, it's probably an easily solved problem, but thinking about the kind of use that we, we should be getting from scholars. Uh, again, we have a, a fair bit of investment in annotation and markup capacities, and we want to see you know, how that's possible to be translated into these like very little formats. Um, um, 
and then again, you know, a continuing worry about how to do these integrations with the, the, the other services that are offered on campus. Uh, so I'll step there, Rob. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, ever since I saw uh, James' presentation about Simply E, I've been asking this question for Columbia. Can we imagine a better academic ebook experience? So I ask all of you and all of us, can we imagine together a better academic ebook experience? So like NYU, the state of academic ebooks at Columbia is, is pretty poor. Um, but just to give a sense of context, um, we have 2.8 million online books available via our uh, Clio interface uh, to our patrons. You can search that link to see the exact number right now via our great blacklight interface, <laughs> little plug. Um, and, but uh, in order to, to put some attention on this locally, I created a small working group and I decided to focus on just 10 vendors. Um, these 10 vendors represent uh, 318,000 total eBooks in our collection. Uh, they had 7.2 million uses in 2017. Uh, we purchased out of that collection of books 15,500 in the last fiscal year and we spent $947,000 in the fiscal year ending uh, June 2017. And these are the 10 vendors. Any of those 10 vendors in the room? Uh, let me know. Okay, good. All right, well, let's talk. Um, but like uh, many of the conversations we've heard from James in the public libraries, the academic ebooks suffer as well. We have an inconsistent user experience, multiple vendors, interfaces, and technology. The discovery and the metadata we get is very inconsistent as well. So finding these books is hard. The vendors, because they don't have an open solution, have been forced to develop proprietary web interfaces, proprietary mobile applications. Uh, licensed and open content is not available via one interface. It creates confusion for our users because they have to go through multiple mechanisms. And our content is fragmented across multiple formats, EPUB and PDF, and DRM and non-DRM seems to be a sticking issue for libraries and I don't understand why because I think most of the reason why is the concept is really bound up in user experience. So for me, this is like the pre-web all over again. Um, back in 19, early 1990s, web technology stunk. But what it had going for it was a common data format with HTML, common back-end web server, common protocol with HTTP, and a common user interface, the dashboard, called a web browser. You could look at a dashboard, a web browser from 23 years ago and look at it today and pretty much know how to drive the, the web. So instead, what we get is things like Adobe Digital Editions placed in front of our users. We don't even authorize it. We have no contractual agreement with Digital Editions. It violates our policies for uh, privacy data as well as core library values. Um, vendors are forced to put up proprietary um, apps like the Blue Fire Reader, which creates support issues for our people who provide frontline support. And then there are these online web interfaces that have just, you know, strange things like icons and graphics that look like something from the 1990s. Uh, Non-responsive interfaces don't, don't work on, on modern tablets or, or phones. And here's the greatest one that I saw, which is a PDFs for all chapters will be downloaded in a zip file. So from one vendor, if you want to actually read the whole book, you have to download a zip file in, in 2017, Re really? So I think we need the same for eBooks that we did for the web. We need to move forward and move beyond this, this path. So uh, we inside our group are working on an academic eBook uh, vendor, uh, an academic eBook uh, e report card. And among these things that we're looking at are these essentials. And these have been echoed by many other groups, Readers First and, and the public libraries, um, and some of the things that James has mentioned. Uh, so the idea of a consistent one, one login, uh, local discoverability that actually connects to our catalog, uh, as, as James was mentioning, the ability to search, download, and read, make this very easy with a great reading experience, and for us, the ability to add some of those scholar tools that, that Dave mentions for annotation, citation, other capabilities, and have that be extensible and fit around the standard, not instead of the standard. Um, I'm, passionate about library branding and uh, of course having good reporting and administrative tools. Library is the brand for me and there's a link there if you want to talk about that. But you know, in terms of how do we build a better ebook, for in our community there are many folks who are spending millions of dollars in support of this. Uh, we have to thank the work from the Andrew Mellon Foundation who's working with the Monograph Publishing in Digital Age initiative that is being led out of that organization and some of the effort coming out of the presses are being funded by, by Mellon. Uh, the Alfred uh, P. Sloan Foundation with Universal Access to Knowledge funding DPLA and other initiatives. Uh, and there's some links there. Uh, IMLS has been supporting this national digital platform that we heard yesterday, and that's funding the work coming out of 
New York Public Library for Simply E, but also uh, Minnesota and Minitex that's also funding some of this effort uh, to build this and, and the Library Simplified.org initiative. And then of course we can't discount the fact that IPDF and EPUB are now part of W3C and there's an active effort underway in the W3C consortium to build a new approach to publishing and there's a link there and the idea that you know the browser could in fact be the reader right with no additional plug-in and, and I think this is really important so the potential of simply e and the open standards approach is to move to a common method of access with one login and to not expose the the, the complexities and difficulties of DRM when you need it to the end user but have one uh, interface, whether you use open content, licensed content, or DRM content, or subscription content, or purchase content, one interface. Have local discoverability, search, download, and read, a fast uh, uh, page experience with a great reading experience, the ability to embed those additional Scholar tools, and uh, the, the support for library branding as appropriate and reporting and administration tools. And I, I'll put a call out to us as a community. We must stop proprietary mobile app proliferation of our content. This is an unsustainable issue for libraries. So I believe we should build a great academic ebook experience, and with your permission, I'll try to do a live demo. Okay, so uh, I'm sitting here with a stock iPad. I'm going to launch the Simply E mobile app. And what I see right away is uh, a rich collection of books from New York Public Library. Thank you to James and New York Public. And I see the Simply E application. So I can scroll down and I can read the apps. But what's interesting about this is I can also look at other collections. So on the top left, what I can do is touch that little library building, and I can see that I have access accessible to us the Brooklyn Public Library, Simply E collection, NYU Libraries, New York Public Library, and Columbia University Libraries. So let's take a look at uh, Dave's New York University Libraries. So Dave has a test here with a number of books from the uh, New York University Press, and these books are loaded here. And we look at this, and they just load in, and this is wonderful. Um, but maybe what I want to do is go over and look at another collection. Now, I could go right to Columbia University Libraries, but uh, I heard yesterday there's a new collection out, right? So this is, let's take a look at uh, Manage Accounts. And when I go to Manage Accounts, I can see that I have a list of all the libraries that I have accessible to us. So this time, I'm going to hit the plus button on the top right. And I see that I have a list of all libraries that, I, that are part of this uh, test system. And I notice right at the very bottom, Open Textbooks which according to James has just been made available yesterday. So open textbooks are now available. I can click that and I can now go back to uh, the catalog and uh, select open textbooks. And now the open textbooks load. So now this is a nice user experience for, for end users to be able to find collections of materials. And if we think about the way a patron in New York City might access collections where we have partnerships between New York University and New York Public Library for sharing resources, someone might be able to go back between these collections and go back between uh, New York University, New York Public Library, Columbia Libraries, the open collections from the same app experience. So let me then jump over to Columbia University Libraries. And now I can see books that are here in the Columbia collection. I'd like to thank uh, the Columbia University Press and the MIT Press, and also Springer for giving us a few sample books that we could load into this demo. Again, demonstrating that we can get these books from different sources and load them all in. And from this point here, I can maybe take a look at uh, downloading a book. So here's the ultimate uh, demo. Uh, I'm hitting download to The Sustainable City by Stephen Cohen, and then I can go ahead and read that book. And the book has been downloaded. So it's find, download, and read. And here's the book from Columbia University Press, available in a beautiful format for our patrons to read, and uh, I think this is a much better experience than, uh, than some other interfaces that we've offered. Uh, then once I have them, I can look at the books that I have available, and I can see the books that I have available that I'm reading at any moment in time. So this is just a taste of what I think the future could be for creating a great academic ebook experience, partnering with our public libraries and our other academic libraries, working within open standards, working with the communities of practice that are really building systems that support uh, our reading experience. I think we can do a much better job. So thank you. And I think we're opening it up for questions. Right? Yeah.